good evening everyone and um, welcome to our online event to officially launch the Soil Sisters interactive map and online display. My name is Hannah and I'm the Community and Learning Officer for West Suffolk at Suffolk Archives and it's really good to have so many of you joining us this evening and welcome as well if you're watching the recorded version later on. Um, just before we start, I'm going to say please bear with us. We haven't used Microsoft Teams Live before um, and you might see some slightly interesting things happening with the screen sharing. So apologies in advance if we fumble that at some points, but we're going to do our best to make it as smooth as possible. So over the next hour and a half, um, you're going to be hearing from a few of us from the project team. So I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction um, about Suffolk Archives and tell you how the project got started. Then our main event of the evening is uh, a talk from Nikki Reynolds, who's a real expert in the Women's Land Army, and she's going to be telling us about the Women's Land Army in Suffolk. Then we are going to hear from two of our volunteers who've been involved in the project. They're going to be sharing some of their favourite stories that they have worked on. And then we're going to introduce the Soil Sisters interactive map and online display, which I'm really excited to share with you. And we're going to round off the evening with a Q&A session. And please feel free to ask questions as we go and we will answer as many of them as we can at the end. So hopefully, if Microsoft Teams has done its thing, your screen should look something like this. Um, you might need to um, move your mouse or tap your screen to bring up these options, but you should at the bottom of your screen have a progress bar uh, with on the left a pause and play button. Um, so that's one of the good things about Microsoft Teams. If you um, wanted to go and uh, top up your drink or get a snack or answer the phone, you can press the pause button. Um, go away and do that. Come back, press play and we will pick up where we left off. Um, also, you can rewind. So if you join um, slightly late or you miss something and you want to go back you can just sort of drag the um, cursor back like you do on YouTube and uh, we will all rewind as if by magic. There is also a subtitles option they are automatically generated so it might put some interesting words in our mouths but if you wanted to try those you can press the closed caption button in the bottom right of the screen. And then for the Q&A, like I said, please do ask your questions um, and you can access the Q&A function using the uh, speech bubble with a question mark in it, which is towards the top right of your screen. So you can open that up, put in a username um, and then type in um, any of your questions and we will look at as many of those as we can towards the end. Just to remind everyone that the um, evening is being recorded and it will go on to the Suffolk Archives YouTube channel um, in the next couple of days. Um, so if you wanted to watch it again or tell all your friends and family about it, they'll be able to see it there later on. So before we get stuck into Soil Sisters, um, I just wanted to tell you a bit about Suffolk Archives in case you've not heard of us before. Um, we're the County Archive for Suffolk. We look after 900 years worth of history and we do that across our three branches. So our main and biggest branch is in Ipswich and that's in a lovely new building called The Hold. We have a sort of medium sized branch in Brace and Edmonds and we have a little branch in Lowestoft, which is inside Lowestoft Library. And altogether, the 900 years of collections we look after take up nine miles of shelving, which is that's quite a lot of stuff to look after. You never run out of things to look at. And there's a real variety of stuff that we look after as well. So this um, slide gives you some um, sort of idea of the, the different types and variety of material that we have. So I mentioned our oldest document was 900 years old. That's the um, sort of square parchment document you can see on the top left of this slide here. And um, that's the I Charter, um, our oldest document. Um, so we've got everything from the medieval up to the very, very modern. So we've been doing um, actually actively collecting stuff during lockdown, for example. So we've kind of got stuff from um, from the eye charter all the way up to a video of the empty shelves in Waitrose in Newmarket um, at the beginning of lockdown last year. So the archive is ever growing. And if you ever come to visit us and get to have a look behind the scenes, this is the kind of thing you'll see. So we've got purpose built strong rooms that are designed to protect and look after and organise the archives so that we can um, find things that our researchers want to look at and also keep them safe for the present and for the future as well. Now, some of you may know that um, one of our big focuses over the last several years has been building a brand new building. Um, for the Ipswich branch. So this is called The Hold. If you haven't visited it yet, then do please feel free to pop down and see it. It's beautiful. It's on the University of Suffolk campus on Ipswich waterfront. 
Uh, it was finished last year. We were due to open um, just when lockdown hit. So obviously the, the timeline all uh, completely changed, um, but the building kind of partially opened last year and it's open again now. So you are able to visit our exhibition spaces, the shop, the cafe, and the search room is due to be opening in September. Now to run alongside the development of the hold, we have also had a series of community engagement projects taking place and these have been happening all around the county. Um, and lots of these are our Sharing Suffolk Stories family of projects, um, of which Soil Sisters is one. So these projects are all different shapes and sizes. Um, some are very focused on a particular location, others um, look at a theme across the whole county, um, but they've all got in common the fact that there is a research phase with volunteers going off to research particular stories from Suffolk's history, and then there is a sharing phase where we share the um, findings with a wider audience. And like I mentioned, Soil Sisters is one of these projects. So back in 2018, we had an open call for project ideas and we were delighted to hear from Nikki and Vicky, who uh, you can see in the picture here, Nikki on the left, Vicky on the right. Um, as you can see, they're a bit interested in the Women's Land Army um, and they got in touch with us to see if we would work with them on a project to research the stories of the Women's Land Army in Suffolk. So 2019, we recruited some volunteers and research began and research is going really well all through 2019 and into early 2020. And then we all know what happened in March 2020. And um, so when lockdown hit, we had a bit of a bit of a pause on the project because initially it was only for 12 weeks, wasn't it lockdown? Um, and when it became clear it was going to last longer than 12 weeks, we realised we were going to have to shift our approach and do things a little bit differently. Um, and this is where we've kind of got more stuck into developing digital resources, which is, like I say, what we're launching this evening. So some of the volunteers who have worked on this project and who you're going to hear from this evening, actually, we've never met them in real life. Um, everything over the last 16 months has been done remotely. Um, so I think it's even more of an achievement for the team that we've um, got this far and, and produced um, produced some finished resources. So that's a good moment to say a really big thank you to all of the volunteers who've been involved in the project throughout its whole lifetime. Um, I know some are going to be listening in this evening and just yeah thank you. We really appreciate you um, taking taking the time and giving your, your energies and your interest to this project and thank you for all of your contributions and I really hope you enjoy looking at the display and the map when we show them to you later on. So if you wanted to find out any more about us, we're suffolkarchive.co.uk on the web. Um, you can see our main email address there, archives at suffolk.gov.uk and you can find us across social media at Suffolk Archives. So now I'm going to hand over to Nikki for her talk on the Women's Land Army in Suffolk. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Hannah. I'm going to um, uh, admit right now that uh, I got quite nervous about actually doing this uh, presentation. Um, it's not something that I'm usually that bothered about, but it kind of felt a bit different this time. So um, so I hope you will forgive me because what I've actually done is to uh, record um, my story on the slides beforehand. I spent most of most of yesterday afternoon and and this and this morning uh, doing this. So um, I hope you enjoy it. During times of conflict, Keeping the home fires burning and contributing to the war effort were vitally important. Whilst the forces were away fighting, there was war on the home front too, with many of the jobs previously occupied by those called up needing to be filled by those that stayed behind. Inevitably, in such times, women came to the fore and took up the mantle of responsibility, with none such better example than those that joined the women. Each county in the country was asked to do its bit and Suffolk was no different. During the war, the battle raged on in the countryside too. The need to produce foodstuffs and fodder to feed a nation was paramount, with women who lived and served in Suffolk answering the call, sometimes without much recognition and all too often without proper or befitting gratitude. Tonight, we want to begin to introduce you to some of the women who served in and worked for the Women's Land Army in our beautiful county. Our research project seeks to uncover information about the Land Army in Suffolk in three main areas. Firstly, the story of members that served. 
We want to explore where they lived and the work that they did across the county. And we want to highlight the achievements of the women behind the scenes in the county administration, those that were responsible for organising and deploying the female workforce across Suffolk. Our project is supported by a group of volunteer researchers who are busy exploring and following up on leads and links, memories, memoirs and mementos of a land army service that has been captured in local archives, film clips, papers, periodicals and books, and from information supplied by families, friends and local heritage groups. In order to take a balanced approach to our research, we've settled on the foundations of our project being from three main sources. Firstly, surviving service records held by the Imperial War Museum and official documents in national and local archives so that we can consider volume, deployment and demand. Secondly, by studying Land Army published correspondence and publications such as county newsletters and the Land Girl magazine in order to build a picture of local organisational structure and activity. And finally, of course, without a doubt, the most rewarding element being from personal testimony and family history by inviting surviving members or family networks to share their memories of Suffolk Land Army service. We are immensely proud and grateful that all the slides used in this evening's presentation features photographs and information about Suffolk Land Army veterans and resources that are drawn from Suffolk archives, family contributions and privately held collections. In order to fully realise the importance and relevance of the female role in our nation's agricultural history, we need to take a brief step back in time. Women have always been working on farms and in agriculture for centuries. Country women have always done farm work on a seasonal basis, but until recently in historical terms, it has remained largely not respectable for women to want to work on The Women's Farm and Garden Association was founded in 1899 by women concerned about the lack of education and employment opportunities for women working on the land. Membership was open to all connected in any way with the land, in farming and gardening and allied industries or with those who had a keen interest in these matters. Many of the founder members were professional women working in education, gardening and farming and in operating small holdings. The association set about establishing training courses and examinations with an employment bureau offering a service for both employers and female employees. By 1910, the association had changed its name to a union. Many of the members were women of considerable resource, with some managing sites of over 500 acres and employing considerable numbers of men. Increasing numbers of decently educated women had been hearing the call of the land and had begun to consider agricultural and horticultural training initiatives. The women who led these schemes were intent on challenging the public perception of the worth of a female workforce in agriculture. It would be these pioneers who would determine how women working in agriculture would be perceived and in time how they would be recruited and trained. It would also be these groundbreaking gentlewomen that would lead the charge during the approaching war. The onset of the war in 1914 saw thousands of women from ordinary backgrounds beginning to be called upon to enter the previously male dominated workplaces. But no one had really taken notice that over 100,000 men from agricultural backgrounds had volunteered. Lots of the fields lay mostly fallow and the crops remained unplanted until the effect of the men's absence became apparent at the beginning of the following spring. In 1915, under the wartime coalition government of Herbert Henry Asquith, Lord Selborne was appointed as the President of the Board of Agriculture and Fisheries, and he was charged with overseeing the country's food supplies. He established the War Agricultural Committees across the counties by the autumn of 1915, and these began to organise women land volunteers, making use of female labour that was available, and so in early 1916, the Women's National Land Service Corps was formed. By the summer of the same year, over 2,000 women volunteers were signed up for action. The work of these women were organised into two main areas of activity, the Forage Corps and the Women's Forestry Service. The main aims were to produce enough grains and fodder to be able to support an army at home and abroad 
and to produce enough timber to use both for industry and to be able to wage warfare. In mid-1916, the passing of the Military Services Act made it compulsory for every British man aged 18 to 41 who was unmarried, a childless widower or outside of protected employment to sign up. Women's work in areas such as agriculture and forestry became indispensable to replace the increased labour shortage. In December, Asquith was replaced by David Lloyd George as Prime Minister. He duly appointed Roland Prothero to be the President of the Board of Agriculture. Prothero estimated that at least 40,000 women working full time were required in the fields. This immediately led to the women's branch of the Board of Agriculture to be formed. German Navy U-boats assaulted our shipping and as a consequence, a record of 507,000 tonnes of cargo were reported as lost, leading to, at its worst point, claims of less than a fortnight's supplies left for the country to feed itself. The government knew that they needed to act fast. So in early 1917, the Food Production Department was formed and the women's branch of this was headed up by Miss Meriel Talbot, who was appointed as the director. Meriel was introduced to the young lady Gertrude Denman, who was at the time the founder and chair lady of the National Federation of Women's Institutes. They began to work together to use their network of contacts and their connections in society to organise a single force of trained women who could be deployed to go wherever and whenever needed to work on the land and to feed the country. Meriel gave over her home in London to become the headquarters for operations and in April 1917, the Women's Land Army was established and launched. Although called the Women's Land Army, it was not a military organisation. Women were employed by individual private farmers and not the state. Nevertheless, Meriel Tolbert was determined it was to be a disciplined service reminiscent of the military style. In addition to the training, the women were provided with designated Land Army uniforms and armbands that symbolised their service to the war. They had a code of conduct to abide by and members faced disciplinary action for misdemeanours. To recognise and reward the work, a series of merit badges were introduced, which could be attached to an armband. Whilst there was no rank structure per se, there were opportunities for promotion, firstly to group leader, and then to instructor in a training centre, complete with higher wages and a distinctive four-woman armband. The Land Army continued its vital work throughout 1918 and 19, as the food situation in Britain and the number of men who could return to agriculture post-armistice remained uncertain. It was eventually demobilised in late 1919. Although the Women's Land Army constituted only a small part of the agricultural labour force, some 27,000 women in England and Wales answered the government's call, providing an invaluable service to king and country. For those that chose to remain in agriculture after the war, there was a need for a new organisation to belong to in order to ensure that they continued to be supported in negotiating fair pay and improving working conditions. So in 1920, the National Association of Landswomen was formed with the Princess Mary as its patron. The association had a motto, unity is strength, and its 8,000 plus members aim was to maintain and develop the professional status of women on the land. In 1939, the threat of war loomed again, and the woman best placed to organise a new army of women working on the land was Lady Gertrude Denman. On the 1st of June, the Women's Land Army was officially reformed with Lady Denman as honorary director. Recruitment for volunteer land girls began in earnest and using her WI contacts, Lady Denman appointed 53 county organisers with each county forming a committee with a chairman and an organising secretary whose job it was to recruit and organise the deployment of the members in contracts of work. On the 29th of August, Lady Denman set up the Women's Land Army headquarters at her home in Balcombe Place, Haywood Heath in West Sussex. Following the example of her worthy predecessor, Trudy decided to make her home of Balcombe Place the administrative headquarters for the entire country. And by September the 1st, 
4,544 volunteers have signed up ready for deployment. Recruitment rallies and prominent advertising was used to attract the attention of young women who were looking for paid employment and a sense of independence. Initially, the age group was for 16 to 40 years of age and women could choose to work locally or to be sent further afield. Many of the early volunteers came from the ranks of those that had served in the Great War and it was not unusual to see generations of females from the same rural based family signing up. Women enrolled at a local Women's Land Army headquarters or by registering their name on the National Service Guide at the local post office. The next step was to undertake a medical test which was paid for by the Ministry of Agriculture. This wasn't usually that strenuous and in some cases the doctor just signed the certificate without carrying out any particular checks. However, girls of a smaller size were questioned about whether they would be able to cope with the heavy manual work and well-turned girls were also questioned about their ability to muck down to the country lifestyle. Women were then invited to attend an interview. This would give the panel a chance to meet the young woman in person. A check also had to be made to ensure that women were not already in reserved occupations. That, that was jobs that were essential to the war. In the early stages of the war, around one in four applicants were successful. If they were successful, women received the Women's Land Army brooch as the first part of their uniform. Once the war started, women had to pledge themselves for the duration of the war. The name was then added to the county register where efforts were made to match them up with a local farmer. As an organisation, the Land Army set out to ensure every land girl was trained for the job in hand. But the logistics of being able to match training opportunity with the members' ability to get there and stay there inevitably broke down on occasions. However, if the training received was minimal, then there was usually the opportunity to learn from others working in gangs, learning by mistakes, which ended up being the subject of an entertaining story retold and inevitably resulted in more than a few that learnt the hard way. The majority of women were given four weeks basic training in colleges and on specialist farms, on the day-to-day -day routines of planting potatoes, milking on the famous rubber udders and learning how to deal with livestock and especially horses. Once trained, the girls could expect to be sent wherever and whenever needed. Some were fortunate enough to be needed in their own county. Others travelled much further afield up and down the country where they experienced new ways of life and local traditions, including sometimes having the added pressure of coping with local dialects. Some women from farming backgrounds were able to forgo their training and be assigned to work straight away locally, which meant they could often work from home. The tiring hard work made some homesick every day, but was nevertheless breaking these women into the tough lifestyle of working in the Land Army. All women were issued with a uniform on joining, although due to shortages of materials and an uncertain demand in the beginning, many girls got their uniforms in dribs and drabs, with some not getting their full quota by the time they'd finished their service. The distinct uniform had some parts designed by Lady Denman herself. The uniform consisted of a multi-function best wear and working wear kit. All uniform issue was regulated by the county uniform officer and checked regularly by county organisers with replacements for some items hard to get. Girls supplemented their uniform by wearing their own clothes but this was generally frowned upon, as was altering or adapting what was issued, unless it was worn out and subject to salvage by recycling or make do and mend. The entire issue of uniform remained the property of the WLA, and it was therefore claimed back at the end of service, despite being purchased by the compulsory surrender of clothing coupons at the point of joining. Average pay for a new recruit in 1939 was 28 shillings which was 10 shillings less than the average male farm worker at the time. This was for a 48 to 50 hour week. So in today's rates, that would equate to about 77 pound. Half the weekly wage was claimed back to go towards food and accommodation. With the introduction of conscription in 1941, the wages rose to 32 shillings a week, with half going back for board and lodgings. Pay terms and conditions improved in 1943,
with the introduction of legislation introduced to Parliament by Lady Denman, known as the Land Girl Charter. The Land Girls Charter addressed minimum working conditions, increased holiday entitlements and capped charges for accommodation and board. All girls received their wages direct from farmers or their employer. Disputes in pay and performance were handled by the county committee or local area reps who completed welfare reports on a weekly basis. Lady Denman confidently boasted that the headquarters in Balcombe was in contact with every single girl on the ground and was confident in the organisation's ability to respond to any issue or concern raised. Women could sign up for a year initially and they could only leave before the year was up if they bought themselves out. Part of the initial supply was a green felt armband with a crown and the WLA embroidered in the centre. For every six months satisfactory service, the land girl would receive a half diamond to attach to her armlet. The colour changed every two years to further denote length of service. The expectation was to be out in all weathers and sometimes from dawn till dusk. And although the maximum working week was supposed to be up to 48 hours, it wasn't unusual for girls to notch up 100 hours or more, especially at harvest time. Every land girl was supposed to have one day off per week, and this was traditionally given on a Sunday. But this wasn't always possible for those that worked in milk production, as although cows could generally tell the time of day, they didn't appear to know what day of the week it was. Land girls were introduced to machinery as it was developed, and after initial training, they soon became proficient at how to use it and maintain them for best effect and continued use. Tractor driving skills were particularly valued and many girls went on to compete in local and county ploughing competitions, some of them taking top honours with both horses and mechanical horsepower. The work that the Land Army were asked to complete was so varied that it was easier to say what they didn't do. They undertook ploughing by hand or using machinery, weeding, hoeing, dung spreading, stone picking, ditch clearing, hedge laying, crop spraying and thatching. They were harvesting in fields, orchards, fruit picking and packing, silage making and market garden work in glass houses and nurseries, with some girls being especially selected to assist scientific colleges, whereas experimentation was made in producing high yield and pest resistant varieties of crops. Girls were expected to be proficient in pest control, catching rats, moles and rabbits using traps, terriers and in laying poisons. Once large scale and regular recruitment was underway, the next hurdle was to consider where all the members could be housed in order to be on the job. Many farmers were reluctant to house young girls that were away from home, for both fear of the proximity of having the hired help living in close quarters and not being able to provide suitable accommodation on farms and estates. There was also the question of who was going to ensure their safety and good behaviour. So the idea of either building or requisitioning older empty properties that could accommodate multiple occupants was developed from early 1942 and together with organisations such as the YWCA and the Salvation Army, the Land Army began to create WLA hostels. The largest purpose built of its kind in Suffolk was at Lakenheath, where the single storey building accommodated up to 116 girls at any one time. Those that lived in hostels and camps were generally well fed, with larger hostels employing civilian cooks and catering staff. Popular work was with the War Agricultural Committees, where the girls could be stationed in large hostels and would be contracted out to local farms with transport to and from wherever needed. Girls could often receive higher wages for war ag work, and this was a lucrative filler in between postings to particular farms. It was also seen as a break away from long term work in one place and was often used as a change of scenery and pace with the chance to utilise and learn other new skills. It was readily recognised that in order to work well, land girls needed to be looked after and fed well, although the end results of this could sometimes not live up to expectations. The Land Army took the physical, emotional and moral welfare of its members very seriously and they arranged for a good network of local support by recruiting volunteer local area reps. 
Their role was to visit every land girl in their patch on a regular basis to check their working conditions and also to be a listening ear and a source of good advice. Girls that lived with farmers were lucky if the farmer's wife was a good cook. Although some were treated poorly with meagre rations and expected to undertake menial or housekeeping tasks, but this was generally sorted out by the local area reps in no time at all. All girls were expected to behave and uphold the reputation of the service. Attendance at church parades and rallies were positively encouraged. All were expected to wear their best walking out uniform at all public facing events. Throughout their service, girls were encouraged to learn and to develop themselves for promotion and extra pay. A set of proficiency tests were introduced which had a 95% pass rate to earn a distinction, which resulted in the award of a proficiency badge. Members could receive more pay for their experience and could be put in charge of less experienced girls, especially in hostels and on training farms, where they could be trained to be supervisors divided into Class A and Class B. The main method of communicating both formally and personally was at the time, of course, letter writing. The Land Army had a letter template and paper form for almost everything imaginable, and much of the county administrative time was taken up with typing, filing and hand recording in records and ledgers. Each county was charged with issu issuing out a monthly newsletter to members, and these would be sent out under war economy postage. When the Second World War began in September 1939, Britain was almost entirely dependent upon imported timber. And when the need for more women to work in the forests once again became apparent in early 1942, the Land Army was approached by the government to take over the large scale recruitment of women from the current membership and those women already working for the Forestry Commission to train and work specifically in the newly formed Women's Timber Corps. The recruitment process was aimed at women of a decent educational standard as the work involved a level of competency in mathematics and calculus. The minimum age for joining from outside of the WLA was 19, when the service was launched alongside its sister service under conscription, with a slightly higher rate of pay to reflect the complexity and physicality of the role. Members of the Timber Corps wore the same Land Army uniform with the exception of a green beret and a plastic cap badge with a pine tree at its centre. Women who wished to identify themselves as proficient and skilled fellers occasionally managed to obtain the crossed axes from a section of the Pioneer Corps as their unofficial badge which they wore on their jumpers and greatcoats. Between 1942 and 1945 nationally the Timber Corps employed a small elite cohort of just over 6,000 women who trained as fellers, measurers, and who produced pit props, telegraph poles, and charcoal, as well as producing large-scale timber supplies for shipbuilding and aircraft construction. Members of the Corps often worked in nomadic gangs across England and Wales, surveying, clearing, and processing the standing timber into essential wartime commodities. Many lived in woodland camps that were previously used by forces as training camps. The largest in the UK was at Colford in Bury St Edmunds. The Timber Corps was demobilised in 1946, with all the women either resigning or returning to the WLA to complete their service. It's clear from what we've covered so far that not only was the work hard, but also at times it was incredibly hazardous. Lady Denman and her team recognised, understood and completely appreciated the rigours and dangers of the land girls' workplace. So she set up a benevolent fund to assist all members who were ill or injured as a result of their work. All girls were encouraged through their monthly newsletters and in the Land Girl magazines to hold events and undertake sponsored activities to raise money towards the fund for which they could all benefit. Hotels in coastal resorts were funded to provide subsidised beds to cater for members to rest and recuperate following periods of illness and injury. In 1943, Ernest Clegg, a famous cartographer, was commissioned by Lady Denman to produce a series of illustrated maps of the most notable counties that showed land army activity. These maps were printed commercially and sold at home and abroad as fundraising items. Unfortunately, Suffolk did not get their map, 
so this is a situation this project will seek to address in the future. Despite almost constant campaigning and lobbying by Lady Denman and her heads of service, the Land Army failed to gain recognition with the government as an equal service for gratuity at the end of the war. Many girls campaigned publicly against this unfairness, and indeed this was to be the final straw for Lady Denman, who decided to step down as Honorary Director in 1945 as a protest to make the point. The Land Army was often referred to as the Cinderella Service, but unfortunately, there was to be no fairy tale ending for this story. As the tide of war shifted in favour of the Allies, the government had already called an end to full scale recruitment in 1943. And at its peak at this time, the membership had stood at approximately 80,000 members. The government had since made use of Italian and German prisoners of war and encouraged the formation of land clubs. These were a popular way to take a holiday in the country for the public whilst getting paid. The Land Army continued to modestly employ a reduced membership until 1949 when a large scale stand down was put into place. The end of an era was marked by a farewell parade held at Buckingham Palace by the Queen. A delegation of the longest active serving members were invited to attend and for a special few the issue of a 10 year badge was made. In Suffolk, a delegation of 10 long standing members were selected to attend the parade. The spirit of camaraderie is legendary amongst land girls, with many of them making and keeping lifelong friendships. In 1964, a former land girl called Jean Proctor held the first recognised reunion at her house, where some 90 odd ex members turned up. Many other reunions followed all over the country and the WLA Association moved to reunite women from every county in all walks of life to get together to remember and to celebrate the lives of those who had given their all for King and Country. The Suffolk's Women's Land Army Association stayed in the two branches of East and West but got together regularly for catch-ups and to attend regional and national events together representing a united county. Unbelievably, it wasn't until the year 2000 when veterans were invited to take part at the march past at the Cenotaph. And it wasn't until some years later when their contribution of effort was recognised by the government at the Memorial to Women in Whitehall. The monument was unveiled in 2006, followed by a medal and a letter of gratitude from the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown. Under the monument is a time capsule that contains original information and documentation in relation to the Women's Land Army that was collated and supplied by the Soil Cinderellas. In 2001, the Suffolk Women's Land Army Association that had met regularly throughout the 70s and 80s and was active with national representations wound up its activities. The beautiful hand embroidered standard made by Ivy White was handed over for custodianship to the Soil Cinderellas. In order to preserve the beautiful workmanship, a new standard was commissioned, paid for by the Suffolk County Council's Chairman's Charitable Fund, in recognition of the contribution made to the war effort by Suffolk Land Girls. This standard is carried by Suffolk Cadet Force representatives at the Service of Remembrance to observe the armistice at the Cenotaph in Ipswich, and is proudly displayed at events across the county as the opportunity arises. It is true that in both world wars, most of the women who entered the agricultural workforce left it again with their lives shifting into marriage, motherhood and domesticity. Throughout both conflicts, women from rural backgrounds experienced little change to their social or economic status, and it didn't radically alter their attitude towards their work either. But for all those women who had not previously worked on the land, the experience was significant and profound. Many of these women undertook work in their service that would never have previously been imagined possible or acceptable, and even members' own opinion of their capabilities were supremely challenged and fundamentally changed as a result of their undertakings. Their contribution to the war effort created an undeniable shift in mindset of the nation 
and for some of the girls personally, an aspiration and achievement that resulted in an enduring investment and commitment in the land that left them and all those that followed on in their footsteps with a permanent sense of self and an everlasting impression of their worth. For all those groundbreaking women, the lilies of the land, the experience was a period of unprecedented liberation and self-discovery. The coronavirus pandemic has inevitably had an effect on our timeline for completion of the project. However, as we're here launching the first part of our project findings, we're also planning the next stage, which will see both a static and touring exhibition and an exciting series of focused event activities at sites across Suffolk that have land army significance. In the meantime, when we can, the project goes out on display at invited events across Suffolk, where Vicky and I are always happy to talk about our passion for all things WLA. And of course, we take every opportunity to pay tribute to veterans and honour their service by attending remembrance services in the county. I'm now going to hand you over to Sue Dring, who is one of our research volunteers, and she's going to introduce you to some of our land girls. Audrey joined the Women's Land Army in March 1943 and spent much of her service delivering milk around Pakefield. She was also involved in field work, including cutting kale and muck spreading. I really enjoyed part of an interview with Audrey when she talks about getting ready for muck spreading with her sister Dorothy on a farm near Kessingland. On this particular occasion, it was Dorothy's turn to drive the tractor and she was sitting on it waiting for Audrey and Wiggy, one of the men, to load up the rolly. Wiggy had been teasing Dorothy all day long and she was sick to death of it, so she whispered to Audrey that she was going to get her own back on him. Audrey tried to put her off, but Dorothy was determined to go ahead with her plan. A bit later on, Dorothy told Audrey to stick her fork into the muck. Up went the tractor clutch and sent Wiggy flying through the air and landing slap bang on top of the muck heap. The air turned blue as Wiggy emerged from the muck heap. Dorothy reckoned Wiggy would stop teasing her now. Daphne Scarf, nay Hedges. Daphne joined the East Suffolk Women's Land Army in October 1945 and left in 1950. She was involved in a variety of tasks, including hedging and clearing woodland, hoeing sugar beet, muck spreading and harvesting corn and vegetables. I enjoyed hearing an anecdote from Daphne Hedges about a rather frightening experience that she had whilst loading a trailer with sheaves of corn in Henley. The girls were loading an XRAF trailer, one that had previously been used to transport aircraft with sheaves to go to the threshing machine. The girls on the ground were pitching up the sheaves and Daphne was on top of an ever-growing stack of straw with two other girls. Suddenly, an enormous American Flying Fortress aircraft appeared over the treetops. It, it flew straight towards Daphne and the girls on top of the stack. Terrified, they flung themselves flat on the stack as they thought the plane was going to knock them off. Daphne was sure the airmen were laughing at them as they approached. It was definitely done on purpose. The flying fortress then disappeared over the treetops as quickly as it had arrived. Once the girls had got over the shock of it all, they did see the funny side. Hello, I'm Ruby. I've been volunteering on the Soil Sisters project since February of this year and I'm going to describe two of my favourite stories I came across during my research. The first is Florence Maystone, a forewoman at the Red House Hostel in Messingham in the northeast of Suffolk. We do not have an exact date of when she came to Suffolk as a land girl, but what is particularly interesting about Florence's experiences in the Women's Land Army is the dangers she encountered. The image shows Florence with her friend Joyce Berry, another land girl and the farmer on a tractor. Working in the fields, Florence would train 15 girls from Yorkshire, driving the tractor and a van and recording the land girls' time spent working. 
The girls who were young and unskilled in farm work were working in the field when Florence was getting into the van to complete their timesheets and she heard a loud bang. She found that the girls had accidentally set off a butterfly bomb, which German bombers dropped in clusters of 12 across the fields of Suffolk. The girls were heavily injured, so Florence took them back to the hostel and treated their injuries. Luckily, there were no fatalities. However, Florence's story shows how the Lion Girls in Suffolk were still at risk from the German raids. My second favourite story is of Phyllis Seymour, who was born in South East London in 1923. She was only 17 when she joined the Women's Land Army at Leavenheath in Sudbury in 1940. Phyllis joined the Women's Land Army after seeing her neighbour wearing a green WLA beret. After catching sight of the Green Beret, Phyllis asked her what she did as a land girl. Phyllis says, she said she was a rat catcher, so I thought I would like to do that. Phyllis also says she wanted a hat like that, although Green WLA berets, as shown in the picture, were not part of the uniform until 1948. So Phyllis may have been misremembering the Green Beret, but she also remembers she liked the sound of being paid three pennies per rat she caught. Unfortunately, when Phyllis joined the Women's Land Army, she was told she was too small to be a rat catcher, so she worked on the land instead. She worked with a pair of sheer horses, turning over an acre a day, ploughing up and down the fields. She worked on the farm next to the hostel, waking up at 6am and working until 8pm in all weathers. While working, Phyllis also faced many dangers. Once she and her friend injured themselves when cutting sugar beet, she'd cut off the top of her thumb and her friend almost her whole thumb. But when they were bandaged, they both went back to work. The land girls enjoyed local activities on their time off, such as going to the pub, but when caught, they were docked a day's pay. Phyllis also remembered going to the two cinemas in Sudbury and catching the bus to the Wednesday night dancers at Colchester Barracks. At these dances, Americans gave the land girls pears and peaches as treats. While on these trips to the dancers, Phyllis met Percy Rose, who gave her a ride on his bicycle crossbar and later his motorbike. Phyllis and Percy married in 1946 in Suffolk, a fortnight before Christmas. Phyllis left the Women's Land Army in 1947 after serving for seven years. Thanks to both Sue and Ruby for sharing snippets of just some of the stories and accounts of Land Army life that have been gathered into the project so far. We have lots more that illustrate both the appeal of the work pitted against some of the very harsh realities of completing work on the home front that is both physical and demanding, whilst undoubtedly being character forming. We are still discovering wonderful new stories every day with contact being made through emails and on our social media pages and stories being shared by families and friends, not only in Suffolk, but from all over the world. It's such a complete joy to discover a new veteran, our Suffolk treasures. And we know that our project, which already feels like a large family, will continue to grow and celebrate together the work and lives of these in every sense of the word, truly groundbreaking women. Now we've nearly reached the end of our presentation, this is the bit where I get to have the honour of saying that the Suffolk Women's Land Army Project content on both History Pin and Shorthand are now live. <laughs> so this is over to you, Hannah. Right, so um, I will just share the bits of screen that I need to share. So um, yeah, I'm really excited everyone to give you a, um, a little tour of what we have created. Um, let's just share my video as well so you can see me while I'm talking. Um, there we go. Right, there we go. That's where we need to be. So um, yeah, so here we have um, the first, well, we've got two two resources we are launching this evening. Um, so this is our online display. It's on a platform called Shorthand, um, and I will send out the links to both of these to everyone who's registered for the event um, tomorrow. Um, so Saw Sisters putting the Women's Land Army on the map in Suffolk. Um, and I won't go through the whole thing now, but just to give you a little preview, 
you can find out about the background of the project. And then we've got lots of um, testimony from um, people who were in the Land Army in Suffolk telling us about their experiences living in hostels. We've got some fantastic images that have been submitted to the project as well as things that were in our archive collection already. And a big thank you to everyone who has contributed material and research to this over the last two years. Um, you can find out more about all the individual bits of uniform and what the women thought about that uniform as well. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever had a chance to actually see any of this stuff in real life, but oh my goodness, it was well made, especially the shoes and the boots. You would definitely know you were wearing them. Um, moving on, um, there is then some examples of how dangerous the work could be and the tragic story that um, Nikki mentioned about the young 17 year old um, who was killed on a farm in Halesworth while working for the Land Army. Um, but then also some of the, the social life um, and the freedom and some of the fun that women got to have as well. A bit of background on the, the Lumber Jills, the Women's Timber Corps, um, which I'd certainly not heard of them before starting this project. So that's been a really interesting side of the Women's Land Army to find out about. And then we've got some stories of some of the individual women who served in Suffolk. And I'm sure we could just keep going, adding more and more um, of these stories. Um, the display will reach a point where um, we won't be able to add any more information to it, but we're adding as much as we possibly can. So again, some of you in the audience may recognise some of these stories and names as your, your relatives. And thank you so much for letting us include and share their stories as part of this project. Um, I'm going to speed up a bit now so that you can um, see the whole thing. Um, and then we finish off by looking at the post-war years and the, um, the lack of recognition that the women had um, at the end of the war and um, indeed until up when they were disbanded in 1950. And then at the very end, we've got if, if, you've, if you've not had your fill of Women's Land Army by the end of all that, we've also got some suggestions for some books and articles and online resources where you can go to find out even more. So that's the display. And next I'm going to show you, we'll give you a little tour around our interactive map. So this map is on a platform called History Pin. Um, it's a fantastic platform and uh, it's based on Google Maps. So if you're familiar with Google Maps, the map interface will look very familiar to you. And you can use this to upload photographs, videos, um, sound clips and information as well. And you can pin it to the map to the, the uh, geographic location that it relates to. So that's what we've been doing with this and you can either browse through the gallery and you can have the gallery fill the screen and look at all the photographs and the stories underneath them and if you see something that you want to see a bigger version of you can click on it and it will bring up the bigger version and then the captions that we've put underneath. And then if you come across something that you know about and you've got information that you can add to it, you can actually do so um, in the comments underneath. Just go back into the gallery. So that's one way of browsing it. Or if we click expand map and then expand map again, you can explore it purely in the map view. So if I zoom in a bit, you can see where all the different pins are. That's where we have pinned our content. And if I zoom in, let's see what we've got in Stradbrook. And if we click on oop, one of these pins, there we go. It will bring up the picture that is pinned to that location. And again, you've got all the information that we have about it underneath as well. Um, so we've got quite a bit on here already at the moment, but we're it's, it's not finished. It probably never will be finished as such. We're hoping this is something that we can continue to add to over time um, and if you have stories or memories or photographs and things that you would like to see added to this map then do please feel free to get in touch with us and we would be delighted to add more stories to this map over time so so pleased to be able to share those with you um, I need to share sorry I need to switch which screen I'm sharing again now so bear with me just a second I'm going to switch back to a 
PowerPoint for the last little bit of the evening. So, so there we go. If you wanted to access the online display, that's the address where you can find it. Uh, likewise, for the interactive map. For everyone listening live, I'm going to send you an email with those links in and for anyone watching um, the recording on YouTube, I'll pop those links in the description box underneath the video. So this is where we're going to have a look at the questions that have been coming in and um, put those to Nikki. So Nikki, are you ready for some questions? I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the first question we've got is, are the newsletters you mentioned um, available for researchers to access? Um, it depends where you are um, and it depends upon which county you actually want to research. So if we're talking about Suffolk, uh, they are in my collection at the moment, um, but there will be copies that will be made available through Suffolk Archives. Um, because we want them to be a lasting testimony um, for people to be able to share when they do research. So, yeah, absolutely. OK, um, right. Our next question was, how can you find out if a relative was in the Land Army in Suffolk? Um, that's a really good question uh, that we can't answer fully just yet. But I would say that um, we are completing and, and compiling a, a like a role of honour, um, uh, which involves Vicky and I doing a lot of research and a lot of backwards and forwards to the Imperial War Museum um, of where they've given us access to the original service records. Now, the caveat that I have with that is that the uh, we're not entirely 100 percent sure that the service records that have remained are complete. Um, but to give you an idea, they are saved. Uh, they're, they're just a little record card. They don't give us an awful lot of detail, but they are saved in alphabetical order of maiden surname. So they're not even listed under the county. So um, so we've got a task in front of us um, that Vicky and I were going in and, and doing on a quite a regular basis with the Imperial War Museum. Um, and we were literally sitting there faced with 167 boxes that contain anywhere between 1000 to 1300 of these service cards that are in alphabetical order. So our task each time we were up there was, was to search through and to pick out a Suffolk um, card. Um, now, that sounds quite easy, but actually when you read these cards and you read some of the comments that have been put on them, um, some of the hand, lovely handwritten notes, it was very easy to kind of get um, distracted and, and, and to look at some of the, the funny comments and stuff that would have been made. I don't know that you would get away with it nowadays in, in terms of um, uh, data protection, um, but certainly in, in the 40s, they didn't worry about what they wrote about girls. Um, so we had um, we, we seem to have had some really, really difficult and truculent Norfolk girls. So I don't know what's going on over the border, um, but we hope to be able to put together a, a, a roll of honour. So and certainly we can use history pin as a way of doing that. So if we can't if we haven't found out about a girl yet, but you know of, of a land girl, then you can use history pin to, to great effect um, and actually tell us about that land girl um, so that we can make sure that they get their name on the roll of honour for Suffolk. Amazing. Thank you, Nikki. Um, that I think largely answers the next question we had, which was, do you have a listing of land army girls names and what area they came from and where they worked? So this was the, the role of honour you were talking about. Mm. We'll fill in as much of that detail as possible. But mm. my, my understanding is from from those index cards, not all of that information no. necessarily got recorded, did it? No, that unfortunately they will they will tell you um, where the land girl first enrolled, um, what the what their home address was when they were at, at the point of enrollment. Sometimes it will tell you age. Sometimes it will tell you occupation. Um, usually have a date of birth or or, or one of the other, um, and it will only really tell you the details of whether they transferred out to a different county and then came back again. So in terms of the actual work on individual farms or in terms of uh, of individual areas, we're not going to know that really, unfortunately, which is sad, but 
you know. Is, but this is the thing with records and historical research, it is, isn't it? It is. And if, if only they'd known at the time that we would be massively interested to know which farm girls were going to be working on. And that, I suppose, is where, you know, so much of what this project has done so far, we've, we've used stuff that's in, in the Imperial War Museum, we've used stuff that's in the Suffolk Archives collection, um, but also it's, it's all the contributions that we've had from um, members of the public who've been sending stuff in as well. And, and that's one of the things that's been really nice is bringing, mm. bringing all of that together, what's in people's private collections at home with what's in, in archive collections as well. So um, yeah, so there isn't a listing of all the Land Army girls' names in Suffolk at the moment, um, but ask again in, in, I don't know, a year, two years <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Yeah. work in progress well, well now things are things are starting to open up again vicky and i will be back to the imperial war museum and beavering away opening up those boxes and and searching through them um so the experience of doing it is is you know is as much as uh, is as much a pleasure as the um outcome from finding a suffolk land girl um, because you know you're you're very aware that you're handling original documents that um, were probably last looked at in 1950 um, when they were boxed up. So and um, they have a, a, a beautiful smell to them um, and a beautiful feel. So and we're always there's always a point of when we get quite emotional um, when we're sort of handling some of them because you you're very aware that the, you know this is this is girls' lives that you've been that you're you've got the um, the, the honour of handling. Thank you, Nikki. Um, right, next question. Uh, this might be a tricky one as well. What was the most unexpected thing you've come across on the project? Um, ooh, that's, that's quite an interesting one, isn't it? I, I suppose for me, it's always a bit of a voyage of discovery. Um, uh, I was quite unexpected to find um, as many veterans that we still got which is an absolute joy um i was quite fearful that that we would have missed that opportunity um but we do have a few rare gems that that, that we have still with us so i i think that's probably the most unexpected part of 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 the of the project so far um and by way the most rewarding as well yeah, the um, having been putting the display together over the last couple of weeks, being able to listen to the oral histories that have been recorded really recently, mm. um, yeah, is is just amazing. Um, <laughs> one of my one of my former colleagues used to say, "Oral history is the closest you can get to time travel." Absolutely. Um, and yes, it's a real privilege to be able to to listen to those. Um, right, the next one that we've got, they're coming in thick and fast now, Vicky. Mm. Vicky. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. Um, so the next one we've got um, is about Sutton Who. Mm -hmm. um, so this chap says, I'm sure my mum gave a lot of information to the people at Sutton Who. I know she had photos as they were billeted in Tranmere House. Um, have you been in contact with the National Trust? Um, so I think um, I, I can possibly help to answer this one as I know that one of our volunteers um, who was part of our original research group definitely was in, in touch yes. with the National Trust. Um, so we have been in contact with them, um, but if there's anything in, that you um, wanted to email us about to make sure that we had definitely um, found out about, then do please feel free to get in touch with us directly as well. Because um, just if there's stuff that that you that you you know for certain that your mum gave to, to Sutton Who, just to make sure that it has filtered through to us. Because um, yeah, I know we have been in touch with them, but yeah, do please feel free to get in touch with us, and we can make up. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure that um, that that. that um, I probably know who we're talking about, and um, I, I can I can honestly say definitely that just before lockdown happened, I was due to actually go out to uh, to Sutton Hoo, um, and they'd arranged for the, um, the, the for the items to be available for viewing, and they're quite happy to share them, um, and uh, so that we can do you know we can we can do some more of that research and get, and get some copies of that as well. So yeah, yeah, it's it's in hand. Thank you. Um, right, next one. What's your favourite story from a veteran? I think from from this project, because obviously, I, you know, I, I've been doing this for a long time and I've worked with some incredible women. Um, I think from this project, my my favourite story would have to be from um, Audrey Baxter. 
and uh, I hope Sue doesn't mind me sort of stealing a bit of thunder. Um, but actually, uh, when I went to uh, interview Audrey, um, she was telling me about her, her and her sister who, who were both in the Land Army and uh, her sister was older than her and her sister taught her to drive in two weeks um, for her to be able to do the milk round um, and to be able to deliver the milk um the milk churns and i just absolutely chuckled at the idea of you know of, of being taught to drive in two weeks and then being let loose uh with this milk sop sopping round in churns on the <laughs> in the back and i think to add insult to injury um audrey then said that the farmer who had given her sister the old jalopy to use actually presented audrey with a new van um, and her sister was very jealous about having that, uh, about her having the keys to the new van. And, uh, and Audrey hoped that she wasn't going to um, do anything to actually like knock the milk over in the back and and uh, and make a mess. So, yeah, uh, and that just really kind of struck me when you think of how long it takes to learn to drive nowadays and all, all, all technical stuff. You know, it's just it's just a, a clue into another era. I think that's yeah, that's definitely something that I've felt when you're reading the stories and, and, and of they did have training establishments and some women did get training but I've read more stories from women saying no I was just sent out with a spade and told mm -hmm. to get on with it having never mm -hmm. done any kind of agricultural work before at all and the fact that some of them were 17 years old it is just incredible um I also read um I come across, came across a story earlier about a woman who did nine years service she had eight children as well she must have been some sort of superwoman absolutely absolutely funding this project um so this is part of um all of the sharing suffolk stories program um along with the the building of the hold we've got external funding um for for these projects so the majority of that is national lottery heritage funding but there are several other funders involved as well but the um the activity plan stuff that we're doing like the sharing suffolk stories project um we have to say a big thank you to the national lottery um for for funding all of that activity and also the fact that lots of people give their time as volunteers to the project mm -hmm. um like Nick, nikki and, and vicky um do all of this as, as volunteers and we've got lots of a whole team of, of volunteer researchers who've been um, going out and uh, finding stuff out and, and writing it up and putting stuff on the map and writing things for the display and everything so um, we've actually not really spent much money on it so far I think we've um, we've managed to to do quite a lot with the um, the funding that we've got so there you go. I hope that answers that question um, Next one, Nikki, you mentioned um, there was a monument that got put up in 2006. Um, where, whereabouts is that? Can people go and visit it? Yeah, absolutely. So that's in Whitehall. It's called the um, the, the Women's uh, Women of World War Two monument um, and uh, it's right in the middle of Whitehall um, and it's a it's a beautiful monument. Um, it's got pegs in 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 its in its bronze. I'm, I'm guessing it's bronze. It certainly looks that way. Um, it, uh, and it's got all the way around the outside. Uh, it's got pegs, and hanging on those pegs are the coats and hats uh, that represent uh, the women of World War Two. So, and uh, not just the um, services, but also those that served on the home front too. Um, so, and I was very pleased to to uh, stand right underneath the uh, the monument um, and and have a look up at the great coat and the hat that's hanging there. Um, I was going to sort of wrap, sort of start to wrap up really, um, and ask. Um, obviously, you and Vicky are, are out and about a lot um, mm -hmm. with with your with your Soul Sisters display um, and ready to to talk to people. Um, are there any? Have you got any um, anywhere that you know you're going to be over the summer where people might be able to to come and see you? Um, well, this year's been a bit strange, hasn't it? So um, we've got uh, a number of events, uh, partic well, not particularly local, I have to say. Um, but if anybody has anything that they want us to uh, to bring the Women's Land Army display along to um, and to come and talk about the project, then we're we're, we're up for coming. So the last question, um, Nikki, is. Um, what do you see for the future of the project? Um, so for me, uh, I think 
the most exciting part to now come um, is that we are planning to do um, an exhibition. Um, and I would like to be able to plan to take that exhibition uh, out around Suffolk and to visit some of the sites of, of land army significance. We've already been um, talking to some of those um, um, sort of event managers and places um, to try and sort of see whether it's going to be possible to put something in their event schedule um, that we can have some 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 local interest in. Um, so for me, I would like uh, people to uh, contribute as much as they can uh, any of their stories. We certainly keep it really busy on our on our social media pages to try and um, constantly keep it on the radar, really. Um, in order to be able to build a lasting tribute to these incredible women. Um, many of them that we've been, you know, so privileged to actually meet, but we know that there is a that there is a window of opportunity. So it's really for us about making as much as we can out of that opportunity um, and to create something that is going to really put the Women's Land Army of Suffolk on the map. OK, thank you. Um, and just we've got a couple of um other bit, other comments about memorials um, that have come in on the, the chat. So um, Stuart says that there's also a memorial to land girls and the lumber jewels at the National Memorial Arboretum in Staffordshire. Mm -hmm. there is. Um, and Georgina says that there's also, oh sorry, they, they were the same, <laughs> also at the National Arboretum. There we go, we've they got are. some they really are. knowledgeable people listening. Lovely, there you go. So uh, National Arboretum in Staffordshire as well. Fantastic. Right. I think we have got to the end of our questions and comments and we're nearly at the end of our time as well. Um, so I will wrap up by saying thank you so much to everyone who has listened this evening and thank you for bearing with us during our technical <laughs> glitches as well. Like I say, went beautifully in rehearsal. Never mind, it's been a learning experience. Um, so yeah, thank you for everyone who has listened this evening. Thank you so much to everyone who has contributed to the project so far. Hope you enjoy looking at the map and the display. And if you want to get in touch with us, that's the email address for the project, sharing.suffolk.stories at suffolk.gov.uk. Um, we'd love to hear from you and uh, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday evening. Um, thank you very much, everybody.